It is the rare television program that leaves iconic images embedded in our consciousness and changes the medium itself. One such show is the acclaimed Emmy and Golden Globe winning series, Mr. Robot. Created by the innovative Sam Esmail, it is my pleasure to share with you his breathtaking vision and insights. Sam, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you here on Between the Lines. Fun to be here. This is going to be fun. It is. And I told you, I hinted at something in the green room where I said I'm going to surprise you with a little something here. I only had, I've had many showrunners and producers on my show, but I've only had two who I've had on in the middle of the series run. Mm -hmm. The first one was Matt Weiner, the creator of Mad Men. Mm -hmm. And the second one now is you, the creator of Mr. Robot. And I'll tell you the reason why. My son said, Dad, you have to watch Mr. Robot because there's something about it that's going to drive you wild. And one of the things he knew was my love that I had for the iconic character Don Draper and the way the relationship was between Matt Weiner and John Hamm to create this character that neither one of them were really like. Well, I watched Mr. Robot and there is Rami Malik, your star, and again, in my opinion, now currently the most iconic television character wow. on, period, bar none. And I said, I have to find out. There must be the same kind of bond between Sam and Rami to get this character to be this way. Oh, yeah. I mean, there is. And it, it was weird to us initially. Uh, you know, when he came in for the audition, I knew nothing of his... Uh, you know, background, um, but, you know, ethnically, we're the same, you know, we're both the, uh, from Egyptian immigrants, first generation Americans. Um, he, you know, we had a lot of similarities in sort of our upbringing, um, the food we ate, you know, the sort of morality we were kind of under uh, growing up. And then also, you know, we had similarities. Our fathers had just passed away years uh, years before we started shooting the first season, so w we had a lot in common, and we were, we were basically like brothers right off the bat. But when you develop this character, neither one of you are necessarily like Elliot, right? Like, right? Yeah. That's what makes it so interesting. Yeah, I mean, he well, he definitely isn't anything like Elliot. He's the most social, like well-adjusted person I know. Um, uh, I, I have probably more in common than uh, than him, but obviously, you know, n nothing close to the actual Elliot Alderson character now. Well, now we start the show off with the, the words "Hello, friend. You're only in my head," and and that concept that you do is you literally uh, again. I'm not saying this hasn't existed. All I'm saying is I am not aware of it in television before. You bring us into this man's head. We play, in a certain sense, a role. He's talking to us, and I and I don't. I know technically, the term is called voiceover, I guess. But you, we need a new name for it because this isn't voiceover like you're used to. This is really. Uh, it really grabs you in the soul, unlike someone who is just reading something voice over. This is putting you in his head. Right. And what, you know, the thing about voiceover, because growing up, especially in film school, you know, voiceover gets a really bad rep. I mean, people really put it down and, and it's oftentimes, you know, in terms of screenwriting, people say it's a, it's a crutch because you can get exposition and information out that um, in, in, in quote-unquote a lazy way rather than trying to creatively put it into a scene. The th I've always resisted that because some of my favorite films, Clockwork Orange, Taxi Driver, use voiceover in this really brilliant way that actually, do, you know, shows the inner life of the character that otherwise you could not do in, in a scene. And yes, there, are, there is that voiceover where it's, you know, it's, it's not even present tense, it's past tense. It's, let me tell you a story and let me fill in all the details. And sure, that could get expository and feel like a crutch. But the voiceover, you know, and this is one of the things that really motivated me to figure it out for Mr. Robot, because I knew I wanted to be in Elliot's head. That's what this show was about. 
Elliot's head, being interior. It takes place in his head. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I thought, thought, came up with the idea of, of us being that imaginary friend, that person that he can confide in. That because if this show's about loneliness, what? Well, how does that voiceover sort of complement that? And I thought, oh, oh, that's interesting. He can't, he can't open up to anybody except this person that he's created in his in his mind. I'm so sorry she was taken away, Elliot. But don't let her death close you off entirely. Find someone you can be your honest self with. Okay. I remember when I was a kid, I got into web design by ripping off sites I liked. All you had to do was view source on your browser, and there it was, the code. You could copy-paste it, modify it a little, put your name on it, and like that, it was your site. View source. What if we had that for people? Would people really want to see? Find someone to be your honest self with. Bull. Really good advice. Thanks. What I thought was that at first when you're watching this, you can't help but feel this is the most alienated man in television, but iconic, as I say, because it's done in such a great way. Yet when we were talking, I said that the thing I want to do is relate to my viewers, and, and, you, and I'm going to use your words as the main writer, creator of this, even though Elliot is speaking them. Uh, a computer hacker with a sense of something wrong with the world that he can't explain. And I cannot help but feel almost everyone on the planet today feels something wrong with the world that they can't explain. Well, yeah, it's not it's not a unique thing. I don't know if it's about our time or not, but I think, but the unique thing is is you know, what Elliot's sense is, and what maybe in a modern context, especially sort of Elliot being a hacker and being in, in again society under this sort of technology you know uh, utopia that we're in right now, if you want to call it that, um, there is a striking way that it alienates us even though it's meant to actually bring make communication faster you can speak to anybody across the globe in seconds for free you know whereas you couldn't do that 30 years ago but yet there's a weird isolationism to it so so if i can just walk, you know look at all my uh f relatives baby pictures on facebook i don't actually ever have to go see them and so you end up you end up sort of substituting. You're having this poor substitute for actual human interaction, but online. And, and that's sort of the alienation that's sort of unique to Elliot, and I think unique to sort of the modern day context right now of and, our world. And I think one of the things that you bring out throughout the both seasons is not only what that implies to us socially, but all the unintended consequences right. That's what this series is also about to a certain extent. It's the unintended consequences of even trying to do what you believe is right. Yeah, and, and that, that to me is, you know, a lot of people call Elliot an anti-hero in this sort of the golden age of television. There's, you know, the, the kind of uh, uh, central characters tend to be these morally ambiguous uh, uh, people who are trying, you know, who have good intentions, but these sort of consequences backfire on them. So then it's about the rubber meets the road. Well, what do you do with those consequences? How do you show up in that, in that point? And that's kind of, you know, the one thing about Mr. Robot, this is season one, a lot of people felt like, well, the ending of season one, well, he did the thing. Well, that should be sort of the end. That's, you know, the, that would be the end of a movie. You know, that, you know, he set out to hack E-Corp. He does it, and there you go. He's success. Well. I thought it would be more interesting. No, what 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 do you do after that? What do you succeed? Are the, are there positive outcomes? And if they're negative, then how do you feel about what you did? And, and you know, those are kind of the more interesting questions. And I think that's true of any sort of interesting choice a character can make. What is it about society that disappoints you so much? Oh, I don't know. 
Is it that we collectively thought Steve Jobs was a great man, even when we knew he made billions off the backs of children? Or maybe it's that it feels like all our heroes are counterfeit. The world itself's just one big hoax. Spamming each other with our burning commentary of bullshit masquerading as insight. Our social media faking as intimacy. Or is it that we voted for this? Not with our rigged elections, but with our things, our property, our money. I'm not saying anything new, we all know why we do this. Not because Hunger Games books makes us happy, but because we want to be sedated. Because it's painful not to pretend. Because we're cowards. Society. Elliot. Elliot, you're not saying anything. What's wrong? Nothing. Well, my son who turned me on to the show, as I said, uh, he said, one thing you're going to have to do, Dad, in this particular show is watch everything because Sam puts nothing in there that doesn't have some sort of meaning. So I was particularly cautious of that. And I'll, I'll never forget this term. And it's used a number of times in the film called The Invisible Hand. Now, The Invisible Hand, I'm assuming you're aware of, is the term by Adam Smith. Right. But it was only mentioned once in The Wealth of Nations. Where it's mentioned twice is in his book called Moral Sentiments. And now you mentioned it three times, at least from as far as I could remember. And I don't think that that may be coincidence. But the point is the invisible hand only operates when there is a morality. And you make that point here. At first, I thought there was a very anti anti, let's me leave him as the anti-guy, Elliot. But when you really look at the invisible hand, he's aware that it's not operating properly, but he also knows that something needs to be done to restore the morality. Right. And once the morality is restored, then things may play out a little differently. Yeah, his, his sort of, and I, I always call it, because I, I look at Elliot in a weird way, as sort of, he's got a lot of naivete for as much uh, uh, wisdom that he might have in hacking and finding flaws in human nature to so, sort of social engineer his way through problems. He, there's a lot of na naivete about the world and, um, and he feels like, de you know, destroying the system is what's going to help it. Now, whether that's right or wrong in the real world, you know, I don't know. But interestingly enough that I think he equates capitalism and and you're right, the invisible hand, I mean, it's all kind of guided by the principle that, you know, we will value the most moral things as a society. We'll collectively sort of, uh, in behind the scenes, tend to, you know, give more value to the positive things for society and, and you know, and kind of subtract the negative things. And that's how the system will work out. The problem is, what if that gets rigged? And that's what El Elliot points out. Well, and, and, that, and that fact, that's what's happening. That's right. what makes it so dynamic. Right. And I mean, we don't, I mean, obviously today we don't live in a pure capitalist. It's crony capitalism, and that's not even debated. But in Elliot's, in Elliot's world, there is no version where we could have a pure free market. It's always going to be rigged. And so in that scenario, what do you do, you know? But in Elliot's world, which is where we live and play, there is still an outside world. And again, I couldn't help but in my blessed opinion, think the truly most moral character that we see is Gideon. Yeah. And again, I couldn't help but remember the reference of Gideon himself. And by the way, the company that he runs is all safe, right. kind of a, a neat play on the words. But he's also, it's throughout biblical times, his names become synonymous with a small military, a successful elite force defending what's right. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I love that you catch on to some of these things. I, I, I never love to confirm or deny, but yeah, we, we definitely take... The thing is, whenever we name any character or even even pick a color for certain details on uh, 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 for the set or the production design, we always try and... We find that the enriching those things with details uh, are, are great, and it's a great way to fill out the world and really underline the theme. 
uh, we take every opportunity to do to do that. And Gideon is definitely definitely one of them. Your line, Elliot speaks it, or mate. I'm not sure if Elliot speaks this. Hold on. Okay. But I'll just see. If it's in the in, in the show. Okay. All right. The devil is the strongest when you look the other way. That's Elliot. It is Elliot. Okay. And so many people don't realize that. They think that it's it's there because it's more powerful than you. But no, it's not. It happens because you're looking the other way. You're not acting with virtue, with moral character, with... and. Elliot knows that. Well, and I think it's a, that's like a human condition thing, I think, right? I mean, how many times do we, do we witness uh, uh, horror in the world and how many times do we do, try and do something about it, even if it's small? I mean, we sometimes revert to this status of, well, I can't, I can't do anything about it, so I let it be. And that's kind of, that's, I think, what Elliot means by looking the other way. I think that all, that's always going to sort of um, be a thing with the, it's, it's not, it's not, look, it's, it's the laziness of society. Like, how much will you allow in the world before you actually have to stand up and fight for it? But there's an, a few themes that also run through, and I'm going to try to get to as many of them I can. And one of them has to deal with choices and control versus the illusion of control. Control is about as real as a one-legged unicorn taking a leak at the end of a double rainbow. Then what do we have? You know that book that people say about how when you fall, you gotta get up? I reject that, man. You know why? The whole thing is a fall. It can't help but be a perpetual state of grasping in the dark. It's not about getting up. It's about stumbling, stumbling in the right direction. It's the only true way to move forward. That is the big theme throughout a large part of this is, are we in control or is it an illusion of control? And if it's an illusion, you also say, does the illusion help you get the control? Yeah, and, that, and that's the question. I mean, clearly we're not completely in control. We've, get, we've given up control to a large extent to government and to corporations to run sort of the different, we're delegating, right? We're delegating certain aspects of our life to either to to all these other entities, um, but we feel like well we have a watchful eye. We feel like we have a choice. Well, we can always retract that control. But I think it. I think we've hit that point, or maybe we've always been at that point where no, no, the it's it's not. We're we're not using them to sort of control the, that aspect. They're, we're not delegating. They're the ones controlling us. They're the ones using that. Well, then Elliot lets us know, and 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 he says then. And again, I, uh, let's not say, Elliot, let me just say these words that you wrote. Then what do we have? Your words. A perpetual state of grasping in the dark. It's not about getting up. It's about stumbling in the right direction. Maybe we are all just stumbling from the right questions to the wrong answers or from the right answers to the wrong questions. But you still give us the answer. Just keep stumbling. Right. And I think, I mean, that was, that was said by Ray, the character played by Craig Robinson, who does an amazing job. And, and I think what he's trying to say there is we have to just do our best. And even if our best doesn't seem that great, even though that with, and it, again, a reflection on what's going on where we may not know what to believe. And that f makes us feel like we're so out of control. We have to keep trying to find that footing. But you give us an answer. True courage is being honest about yourself. Probably the hardest thing for each and every one of us to do. At the end of the day, the heartbreaking thing is all the, all the, the, the honest feelings about you. All this other stuff you're sort of hiding behind the truth about who, how you feel about yourself. And we were talking about love before. 
this is you know is about loneliness is about love well it is ultimately about can Elliot find a way to love himself because I think all of these things that he's going all of these machinations that he's trying to like uh, uh, navigate is ultimately goes back to that point of I don't know if he loves himself and that's the scary that's the honest answer that he needs the courage for oh and and you know there's also another part as I say there's, I always look at things, they're soulful and they're spiritual. And I, I once was given the definition that soulful is when you look inward, spiritual is when you look outward. Right. And you actually have a part where you do a little bit of both, and I want to use your words. You're only seeing what's in front of you. You aren't seeing what's above you. And I thought that was another dilemma that Elliot is facing. He's not almost sure. In fact, he, there's a whole great scene of when he's trying to slow things down. And I, I'll never forget, famous athletes always tell you that you need to move and react fast, but you must slow things down. And right. the greatest baseball players say they see that ball coming and they can count the stitches on it because they can slow it down. So Elliot, in trying to figure out what's above him, what's in front of him, He's doing his best to slow things down, but the world is moving so rapidly. It is, and and that and that gets to because we talk a lot about religion, and not not in spe in a specific way, but in that spiritual way that you're talking about, and 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 it gets to and it's not you know not to get into the definition of what God is or what God could be, but Eliot does feel purposeless. I mean, that's what the, that's how the whole series sort of kicks off. He doesn't feel like he matters. He feels like he's a button pusher. And I think that's that sense that there's something wrong in the world. And um, and he is a little lost and he, and he does need that guiding light. And a lot for a lot of people that is God, but for other people it's that spiritual connection with the world and how do I fit into it? And that goes back to identity and goes back to finding that sense of purpose. And one of the guides you give us is this. Life is a balancing act, and we're all just doing our best tightrope walking above the pit of ungodly, <laughs> talk about spiritual, pain that's daring us to trip up. And again, it's hard to relate to Eliot as a character if you look at him outside of the light of humanity. But once you bring him into the light, which you do so perfectly, into our lives, we feel that. Everyone is feeling that. We're walking this tightrope along with Elliot as he's trying to find the love for himself. We're trying to find that same thing. And we're realizing, gosh darn it, the hardest person to love is yourself. It's, it is. it's such an absurd, it's an absurdity almost, but it's the deepest truth I know. It, it's it's 100% the, the, the thing that I think underlines everything about the show and about uh, Elliot's emotional journey. And it is that thing that I think we all relate to the most. It's almost cynical to admit that you love yourself. Uh, I think we are being dared every day uh, uh, to not love ourselves, to, you know, to, uh, you know, be either sarcastic or uh, be defensive or, uh, or or gloat about what we have or what we own or who we are. Um, it's 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 very much not encouraged to actually get down and dirty, and and then appreciate who that person is underneath. And I think that that really uh, is the underpinning of what Elliot is going through in the whole series. Oh, you you can feel it, and as I say, because we're in his head, right? You make us feel it. One of the things I actually say is. <clears throat> Because you hit it right on the head. It almost seems egotistical to say, oh, I love myself. Right. I don't mean it even that way. I, and I know you don't mean it that right. way either. What I think, if, it, if I'd be happy, if we could just be a little kinder to ourselves. <laughs> right. right. And, and, and that, see, in terms of that, because a lot, you know, the superficial thing or the, the very surface level way of kind of trying to solve society's problems, if you even want to call it that, is that people need to be kinder to each other. But I really think it starts there, and I really think that's probably the root of all the, the the problems and this rise of depression and clinical depression or mental illness stems from that relationship with yourself. Absolutely, and on that note, Sam, you're going to come back. I know we talked about this. this you're going to you're going to come back. Absolutely. But I'm going to end with these words, your words. Find out the future you're fighting for. If you like it, it's beautiful. 
Thank you, Sam, for giving us such a beautiful series. Thank you so much. That it's was, my pleasure. This was a lot of fun. Uh, my pleasure, and thank you all for joining us. Now, before Sam leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Mr. Robot. Every day we change the world, but to change the world in a way that means anything, that takes more time than most people have. It never happens all at once. It's slow, it's methodical, it's exhausting. We don't all have the stomach for it. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between exhaustion and the pains in our stomach, there is a path to change the world in meaningful ways. Seek it and you will feel the meaning. Thank you, Sam. To connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com.